Okay, the final session of the conference um, is a discussion of messianic hope, which has been alluded to in a variety of, of papers by a number of the participants uh, earlier in the conference. So we're very happy to, to conclude with this session uh, and this topic. The presenters are uh, Professor Alan Middleman. Professor Middleman is Professor of Modern Jewish Thought and Head of the Department of Jewish Thought at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, where he also serves as the Director of the Seminary's Louis Finkelstein Institute for Religious and Social Studies. Professor Middleman is author of four books, Hope in a Democratic Age, Between Kant and Kabbalah, Politics of Torah, and The Scepter Shall Not Depart from Judah. He's also the editor of four other books, Uneasy Allies, Jewish and Evangelical Relations, Religion as a Public Good, Jewish Polity and American Civil Society, and finally, Jews and the American Public Square. Uh, Professor Christoph Schmidt uh, will also present. Uh, Professor Schmidt was not part of the uh, original group that worked for two years, but we're very happy to adopt you into the family, Christoph. Um, uh, professor Schmidt is a professor of German literature and modern philosophy at Hebrew University. Since 1996, he has been a colleague at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute and has organized study groups and conferences in the field of political theology. His main fields of interest are phenomenology, aesthetic theory, and political theology. Dr. Deborah Weissman is a resident of Yerushalayim where she has devoted her life to Jewish education and interfaith relations. She's the president of the International Council of Christians and Jews and a member of the Academic Advisory Council of the Swedish Theological Institute in Jerusalem, as well as the International Editorial Advisory Board of Nashim, a journal of Jewish women's studies and gender issues. And she's also on the editorial board of the Studies in Christian Jewish Relations. Our latest publications include Jewish Religious Education as Peace Education, Towards a Humanistic Hermeneutic of Jewish Texts, What We Are and Who We Are, Educating for the Universal Particular Dialectic of Jewish Life. Uh, we will also have a paper uh, jointly written by Professors Yoram Bilu and Tzvi Mark. Uh, Tzvi Mark is the Senior Lecturer in the Department of Literature of the Jewish People at Bar Ilan University and a fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute. And uh, Professor Yoram Bilu is the Professor of Anthropology and Psychology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His main publications include Grasping Land, Space, and Air in Contemporary Israeli Discourse and Experience. And he has co-edited with Ayal Ben-Ari, Without Bounds, The Life and Death of Rabbi Yaakov Wazana. I'm very happy to, to give the floor at this point to Professor Middleman. Thank you, Dr. Korn. Um, in the uh, morning session, uh, Eugene Korn had uh, told us that Rationality has something to do with, uh, with purposiveness. And um, I think that's a good segue, even though it's a thought several hours old, uh, to my own paper. Um, because to ask a question of hope, uh, Kant's question, what may I hope for, um, is not to ask a question about just some individual uh, uh, errant uh, emotion. It's to ask, uh, uh, a question of uh, ultimate purpose. Uh, to inquire into hope is to inquire into uh, human purposes and historical ends, it is to ask such questions as, what is my life for? How shall I orient it? And collective question, a collect, uh, question of public hope. What can we achieve together? Uh, how may we achieve it? The question, uh, that my paper tries to focus on is interrogating 
a tradition of Jewish messianism, a tradition I think that can be called realistic messianism. My question is simply, how realistic is it? Um, and uh, my answer is uh, not very. But to unpack that, I'm going to read uh, about a third of the paper and, and talk through some of the other bits. Hope, as Emily Dickinson famously wrote, is a thing with feathers. But it is also, to continue the avian metaphor, a thing with claws. Hope enables our imagination, moral and otherwise, to take flight. It lifts us above immediacy and fills our expectation with confidence. Without hope, we are consigned to fate. We acquiesce in the status quo. We repudiate our partnership with God to advance the good that resides in creation. But hope also pinions us to our dreams. It undercuts or, complement or complicates our rational assessment of possibility, rendering us vulnerable to fantasy and illusion. Hope can be injurious and false. True hope, whatever that might mean, ennobles us. False hope can distract and debase us. So with hope comes risk. Hope, like faith, is a complex interplay of reason and imagination, of cognition and emotion. It begins in desire and yearning and arcs into images and symbols of fulfillment. It is stirred by the travail and want of the present. It intends the fullness and completion of the future. Hope is expectation colored by a mysterious confidence that expectation has good grounds. True hope is not mere wishful thinking. It is arduous, as Aquinas says, not idle. It senses that the desire and yearning from which it springs spring themselves from something deep and true. This is the source of its mysterious confidence. The object of desire is an object that ought to be. The ought indicates transcendence, that which is not, but which beckons. Thus, hope often arises from our sense of justice, from our experience of the outrage of injustice. Hope, when it intends the dominion of justice, of law, right, desert, and recompense, seeks to affirm a transcendent dimension of human affairs. Ought supervenes on is. To hope is to affirm an ideal based on an intuition about the goodness of life. Hope asserts what is felt to be truth. This separates it when its objects are high and worthy from wishes and dreams. Hope entails a radical axiology rather than a spurious wishfulness. But wishes and dreams, the flights of the imagination, are nonetheless often implicated in acts of hope, particularly as those acts are articulated in cultural patterns across spans of time. In the Jewish tradition, eschatology is a prominent locus for the hopes of a savaged people. The endless injustices of history will be made right at a consummation of history. The ideal pattern of a just society limbed by the laws of the Torah will be enshrined in an eschatological polity. In place of tyranny, there will be accountable rule. In place of poverty, plenty. In place of degradation, dignity. In place of humiliation, respect. The way the world is will give way to the, will give way to the way it ought to be. The hope for a definitive dominion of the good is rooted in the earliest memories of the Israelites. That God entered history to declare an end to the injustice of slavery, that he miraculously liberated his people, gave them a model law, and brought them to a promised land, set the pattern of expectation. Injustice can be repaired. It is not a decree of fate. Society can be bent to the demands of a just law. Political life in a fertile, lovely land can be fair and humane. The Israelite experience had traces, foretastes, fabled memories of these blessings. That real experience fell tragically short of these blessings could not cancel the transcendent normativity of the blessings themselves. Indeed, it strengthened their appeal. 
Imagination embroidered the memories of liberating acts, righteous kings, and justice-seeking norms into scenarios of eschatological resolution and consummation. In his essay on the Messianic idea in Judaism, Gershom Shalom distinguished between different modes of the eschatological imagination. In some texts, the emphasis is restorative. Eschatological hope focuses on a return to imagined conditions of holiness, purity, and justice at the beginning. The orientation is conservative. What was once right will be restored. This is an orientation highly compatible with Jewish law, which projects an ideal that is not so much rooted in the past as it is available in the present. Were the law to be practiced with full devotion, were it to fill and shape the souls of its devotees, the saintliness of persons and the justice of society would themselves constitute the eschatological fulfillment. The days of the Messiah grow naturally out of the norms of the Torah. In other texts, the emphasis is apocalyptic. Eschatological hope posits a complete break with nature and history as we know them to date. The end will be nothing like the beginning or the middle. Eschatology is a theory of catastrophe, in Sholem's words. Nothing we can do can bring about the end. It does not matter whether we strive to improve the world through moral exertion or abandon it to irresponsibility. It will all come crashing down. God will bring the end in his time, irrespective of our action or inaction. The future eon will not develop out of the present order. It will supplant it in ways that exceed our most fervent hopes. Imagination is given a free range here. Heaven and earth mingle. Death itself will die as the tombs open and the dry bones are knit together in life again. These two tendencies, the restorative conservative and the apocalyptic utopian, are not wholly distinct from one another in actual cases of Jewish messianic thought. They are ideal types, relative emphases. Nonetheless, in the tradition that I want to explore here, the medieval and modern rationalist tradition, the restorative tendency predominates. Apocalyptic, utopian, and fantastic elements are minimized, if not entirely extirpated. A rationalist emphasis stresses the continuity of the laws of physics, as it were, and of the patterns of history. It focuses on the amelioration of the world as it is, on the perfection of creation and culture through the exercise of human intellect, ethics, and law. It sees, in the, it sees the end in the beginning. The Torah's blueprint for an ideal society will be actualized. The Talmudic and medieval expressions of this kind of view do not assume, as the modern ones do, a doctrine of progress. Nonetheless, all expressions of this view prize human action guided by right reason as the crucial lever for moving history forward. The passivity of apocalypse is rejected as are its extravagantly imaginative features. Yet imagination cannot be banished, for hope is impotent without imagination. The rationalist views accept this, but domesticate imagination to a naturalistic and normative framework. In what follows, well, in the, in the paper, at any rate, I don't have time now uh, to tell you uh, what follows. Um, but in the paper, I, I look at several contributions to this framework and raise criti critical questions as to their coherence and plausibility. My aim here is not to carp or quibble with searching and earnest thought, but to drill down into a basic problem. I personally accept without question the superiority of a naturalistic and normative, what I will call a realist account of messianism, over an apocalyptic and indulgently fictive one. A realist account represents the sum of what we can hope for as public men and women, as communal political and economic beings. Such an account could orient our politics and ethics, could give us confidence in our collective human future. But it can only do so if it is more than merely edifying. It must be non-fictive in a strong sense, not only realist in temper, but realizable in principle. 
do programs of realist messianism actually pass this test? Do they in particular make sense from the point of view of political economy? How far can their programs be carried forward without paradox or paralyzing internal contradiction? In the next section of the paper, I look into some of the biblical and Talmudic roots for this realist tradition of, uh, of messianism. Uh, the messianic faith, uh, in the view of uh, the biblical scholar uh, John Levinson, uh, is to be found in what he calls the, uh, the Zion uh, covenant, the covenant between God and David, in the house of David. This is the covenant that orients Israel in history, whereas the Sinai covenant sort of orients Israel in terms of, a, of, a, of, a, of an eternal present, uh, in Levinson's view. And it's in some of, the, uh, some of the prophetic expressions like Haggai and Zechariah that you have this uh, emphasis on realistic human action effected through uh, uh, the medium of politics to bring about the final consummation of history. Um, in the Talmud, you have a f famous uh, saying of uh, the sage Samuel, that there's no difference between this world and the days of the Messiah, except that in the latter there will be no bondage to foreign powers. As it says, for the poor shall never cease out of the land, from Deuteronomy 15.11, implying that even in Yemot HaMashiach, the poor will continue to be in the land. So there's a kind of realistic continuity. The one, of course, as I think everybody knows, who really builds a, um, a very rounded, uh, nuanced picture of this is Maimonides um, in the Mishnah Torah. Um, Maimonides uh, says, the Messiah will arise and restore the kingdom of David to its former might. He will rebuild the sanctuary and gather the, dis the dispersed of Israel. All the laws will be re reinstituted in his days as of old. Do not think that the Messiah needs to perform signs and miracles, bring about a new state of things in the world, revive the dead and the like. It's not so. Rather, it is the case that, these, that in these matters, the statutes of our Torah are valid forever and eternally. Nothing can be added to them or taken away from them. And if there arise a king from the house of David who meditates on the Torah and practices its commandments like his ancestor David in accordance with the written and oral law, prevails upon all Israel to walk in the ways of the Torah and repair its breaches, fights the battles of the Lord, then one may properly assume that he is the Messiah. If he is then successful in rebuilding the sanctuary on its site and in gathering the dispersed of Israel, then he has in fact proven himself to be the Messiah. He will arrange the whole world to serve only God. As it is said, for then shall I create a pure language for the peoples that they may all call upon the name of God and serve him with one accord. Let no one think that in the days of the Messiah anything of the natural course of the world will cease or that any innovation will be introduced into creation. Rather, the world will continue in its accustomed course. Now, a number of modern thinkers take up this forceful statement from the Mishnah Torah. Um, and the people that I uh, explore in my uh, paper, whom I really can't talk about here because of the limitations of time, are, first of all, Hermann Cohen, uh, who takes this program and gives it a modern post-enlightenment um, uh, expression that is uh, philosophically rigorous, uh, wedded uh, as well to a politics, the politics of democratic socialism. I then look at Cohen's disciple, Stephen Schwarzschild, who does the same thing and makes it even more um, contemporary. Uh, these are serious uh, proposals for a messianism of the doable good. I look then at uh, a contemporary figure, uh, known, unfortunately, only to a chosen few, a man by the name of Len Goodman, a professor of philosophy in the United States, who in his wonderful book on justice also has a very full-fledged messianic doctrine 
not as Kantian as Cohen and Schwarzschild, also involved in questions of politics and economics, but basically working the same, the same uh, uh, furrow of um, messianism as fully instantiating the laws of the Torah in uh, a manner that is doable, realistic, and uh, achievable by the Jewish people uh, in concert with others. So in a way, for all of these people, the only thing that uh, prevents the uh, infinite amelioration of our world is a lack of will on our part. Uh, there aren't any structural uh, constraints. There's no original sin. There's no moral man but immoral society that will be eternally in opposition to each other. There's a kind of profound uh, hopefulness uh, about these projects. Another one I could mention is uh, Professor Kenneth Siskin, who has a forthcoming book uh, with Cambridge University Press called Messianic Hope in an Age of Despair, which very much is like uh, Hermann Cohen and Stephen Schwarzschild. I don't have any time to, um, to lay these out. But um, I would, in the uh, remaining five minutes, like to give you my critique of these views without, uh, I think, unfortunately, having really given you much of the tissue of these, of these views. Let me pick up my critique from the, um, uh, just mentioning a bit about Len Goodman, uh, so you can get at least uh, one sense of this. How does Goodman's vision stand with the economic dimensions of a good society? The Torah aims at, quote, the maintenance and enlargement of the sphere of respect and concern rather than of interest and advantage, end quote. It does not intend that we transcend the world of the market, but that the alleged autonomy of the mercantile sphere be dispelled and that economic relations be remoralized. Quote, biblical legislation, the locus of an alternative paradigm to that of pure civility, restricts market contractual relations in numerous ways, from the reservation of gleanings and the corners of the field for the poor, to the prohibition of land ownership by priests and ordination of a fallow period for the land. The nisus of the law tends to deflate the notion of the omnisufficiency of economic welfare, end quote. Only the most orthodox free market devotee would argue that any Torah rules regulating competition or resource allocation are wrong in principle. There are always constraints on markets. The more interesting analysis would be into how particular Torah rules affect market relations in particular circumstances. Did rabbinic attempts to break up monopolies on a vital good or service in a medieval kehillah increase market access and drive down prices, or did they discourage producers? How workable were rabbinic strictures about fair and reasonable profits? Did they ensure equity or inhibit growth? Goodman's vision, unlike that of uh, Cohen or Schwarzschild, tries to straddle a realistic appreciation of the wealth-generating potential of markets with an attention to the underlying and contextualizing moral relations that make markets possible. This is very much in line with philosopher economists such as Amartya Sen or Daniel Hausman. Um, I'll skip over that <clears throat> detail, but uh, it just trying to give you a, a sense here that the proposals for realistic messianism of someone like Len Goodman are very, very realistic in terms of some contemporary uh, philosophy of economics. But still, I think there's a problem. Uh, there are limits to realistic messianism, conceptual limits. It cannot remain aloof from the paradoxes and trade-offs of the human condition, especially those ensuing from the fundamental problem of scarcity. It needn't be the case in relations between Adam le Chavero, let alone relations between uh, man and God, that commitments always entail costs. To pursue one good, say friendship or fidelity, need not tragically undermine the pursuit of another good. Life can grow in a virtuous circle. There is no finitude to friendship and fidelity other than the finitude which marks individual human lives. In principle, friendship need not be a scarce resource. 
But that is not the case with material goods. In a world of limited resources, which we actually inhabit, economic transactions entail consequences, some of which are not benign. The rising prosperity of China, India, and Brazil entails, for example, accelerated environmental degradation. There is a cost to be paid in climate change. There will always be trade-offs of this kind. A realist messianism wisely promises no utopia where there are no costs to be paid and where all contradictions are resolved. It promises a future where contradictions can be smoothed out and minimized, where blessings for some do not necessarily entrain curses for others. But in the proposals that I didn't have time to present, I'm afraid they are not uh, realist enough. All of them presuppose some gradual transformation of human nature in which we will become more refined, uh, we'll treat one another more kindly, our appetites for material goods will decline, we'll focus on what's really important in life, but the basic question I raise of all of these views in the paper is that if we are morally renewed such that we want to commune more, we will consume less. And as we consume less, as the demand curve goes down, the supply curve is not going to go up. And how can you sustain an affluent society if you have a society of morally transformed saints who don't really want for very much, why wouldn't you just get a static economy, uh, which would be nobody's idea of a messianic age, because under the conditions of realist medicine, uh, messianism, you'd need a lot of money, for example, to do high-end medical research to uh, combat uh, the diseases and so on that will still afflict us in a non-utopian future. So my critique is these views do not take the trade-offs uh, seriously enough. So, in conclusion, the realist messianist tradition is neither tragic nor ironic, neither Augustinian nor Niburian. It represents the endurance of a form of political hope born in the biblical and Hellenic past, yet active today. It is an ancient politics that still aspires to achieve the summum bonum in this world through moral, legislative, and governmental means. This politics was most memorably framed, their differences notwithstanding, by Plato and Aristotle. The Torah and rabbinic tradition fully complement, enrich, and complicate that politics. As messianism, rather than Hellenic political philosophy, the tradition represents an important strain of Jewish hope. It is hope in a doable good. For some, such as the many contemporary Jews who talk of tikkun olam, a vision such as this orients normative conduct and thought. For others, perhaps those most impressed by the crooked timber of humanity and the mounting threats to democratic ways of life, this is no more than a dream. There can be no blessings without curses. To believe that messianism can be realistic entails that the contradictions in which all human institutions and practices rest can be expunged. expunged. It entails, to use the economist's term of art, that choices are possible without opportunity costs. In a world of finite resources in which minds with finite knowledge must choose, there will always be costs. To wish them away is wishful thinking, not the profound and sober hope that scales itself to the possibilities inherent in the real world. Let us leave the business of messianism to the Messiah, such skeptics might say, and concentrate without illusions on restraining the evil in this world for some, the idea of a realistic messianism is the linchpin of Judaism. For others, it is a distracting fantasy. What should we hope for? Kant would say not to be happy, but to be deserving of happiness. This may be too little, but it contains something true. We may well remain skeptical of the grand goals which religious reason, cum imagination, set before us, but we ought to remain true to the rightness and the goodness of the norms that fund those goals. Whether our actions bear fruit in some vast messianic way is less important than that we continue to act with fidelity toward what we know to be right, toward what we know promotes the good. Whether that good finds its ultimate realization in our world is not wholly in our hands, despite whatever efficacy our deeds ultimately may have. To hope for a world not happy, but deserving of happiness is hope enough.
Okay, my talk will be in some <coughs> ways will be a continuation of the idea of a skeptical messianism that Alan Mittelman just presented in uh, his fine talk. Uh, skeptical messianism against uh, all its enthusiastic and apocalyptical forms, but when I uh, adopt this, I mean uh, a critique of modern enlightened the political messianism of modern enlightened culture as uh, developed from Lessing until Ernst Bloch. I see one aspect of a skeptical messianism in what I call the post-secular relation, which was developed in a in the famous debate between Jürgen Habermas and Cardinal Ratzinger in Munich 2004. is a new mode of interrelation between religion, religious society and secularity beyond delegitimization. And I shall present this uh, post-secular re uh, relation uh, with the claim that there are three presuppositions in order this, uh, that this uh, uh, post-secular relation can work. First of all, it presupposes a radical critique of modernist political theology. Two, um, a new a reassessment of the modern canon, and three, a radical critique of the what I call gnostic option or threat um, of or in modernity. The German philosopher Jürgen Habermas considered the necessity of a critique of pure secular reason already some years before the famous debate with Cardinal Ratzinger in Munich 2004. Due to the globalization of the market and a progressing atomization of the citizens, Habermas thought that secular society would no longer be able to reproduce the very value system it relies on, namely its most important value, solidarity. Habermas thought that only a new definition of the secular attitude towards religion, which has kept these values over the centuries alive, could help modern society to escape this value crisis. This, however, would demand the correction of the classical enlightened attitude towards religion, which tended to delegitimize this or the metaphysical concept of its truth. A new, a post-secular understanding was thus developed by this major representative of modern enlightened critical theory, which would plead for a new attitude of both secular society and religion beyond the classical strategies of mutual delegitimization. In fact, Habermas did not have to wait for the ecclesial response since the church had already formulated its response 40 years before in Vatican II. Libertas non datur sine veritate, freedom is not given without truth, was the formula which initiated a critique of pure dogmatic reason. This critique demanded the end of the war and resistance of the church against the idea of modern secular freedom in the name of dogmatic truth. The modern church expressed then its regret for having fought against the emergence of a secular society of freedom in the name of religious truth, but reminded this modern society in return that liberty without a clear value orientation would be a dangerous loss, the very loss which Habermas complained about and brought him to a new appreciation of religion and church. The debate in Munich 2004 between Habermas and Cardinal Ratzinger led to a full agreement between these two representatives. Ratzinger, then still head of the office of Doctrina Christiana, the former Inquisition, and Habermas, the great public inquisitor of enlightened theory of the Frankfurt School. Liberty was the very principle which allowed for the definition of a new post-secular relation between secular and religious society, which would be founded on a mutual need and a necessary critique of each other. In the following reflections, I want to outline three issues then, which are directly connected with the possibility of this post-secular relation, namely the problem of modern political theology, the question of modern canonicity, and what I shall call the gnostic option or threat. I shall claim then that the post-secular relation demands a radical critique of enlightened political theology which saw itself as the political fulfillment and suspension of the Christian messianic hope for the kingdom of God. The post-secular relation thus demands a post-messianic attitude. In as far as this enlightened political theology created a modern canon of its own, adding to the classical canon of Old and New Testament a third testament of enlightened reason, it adopted, in fact, a double messianism. 
Modern enlightenment was supposed to suspend Christianity in the same way that Christianity saw itself as the messianic fulfillment of Judaism. Only a radical reassessment of these two canonic suspensions will allow for the full develop development of the post-secular. And this post-canonic modernity will not only be only an answer to the various forms of political messianism, but it could function and will function as an answer to what I shall call the Gnostic option or threat of modernity raised by Adolf von Harnack, Erik Wögelin, and by Hans Blumenberg. All of them pled for an anti-messianic detachment of the canonic partners from their predecessors or successors, thus absolutely isolating the canonic elements from each other. So after leading briefly with the problem of enlightened political messianism, I shall interpret the Ratzinger-Habermas debate on the post-secular relation as a path between these two options, namely the messianic and the gnostic one. The attended post-secularity is, as I suggest, post-messianic, post-gnostic, and post-canonical, thus in fact re-adopting the canon of enlightenment as a diachronic succession of Old and New Testament and modernity without overloading it eschatologically or dissolving it in a gnostic way to the problem of political theology. From the beginning, the Enlightenment was characterized by an inherent ambivalence between its idea of a secular culture and its messianic concept of politics, so that the borders between secular and religious society, state and church, between political and religious authority, were dissolved in the idea of a society as the third realm of freedom and redemption from domination. Gotthold Ephraim Lessing used an apocalyptic rhetoric when he described the age of 18th century enlightenment and emancipation as the age of the Holy Spirit, which would represent the true practical reason beyond political power. The detachment from orthodox and dogmatic religion would necessarily lead to an adoption of the true Christian messianic message of freedom and love as the foundations for the new ideal society to be erected here and now. The enlightened subject, after having fettered the serpent of sin, would thus do the good only because it is the good, that is, because he or she rationally understood the meaning of goodness and would act according to this rational understanding. When sin would be overcome, the heavenly Jerusalem could be erected then by all enlightened and illuminated rational human beings as the ideal human society of freedom. The ambivalence of the enlightened concept of politics between a detachment from religion and its messianic implementation has determined as well Immanuel Kant's religion within the borders of reason alone from 1793, even if Kant was a bit more careful when it comes to the enthusiastic possibilities of a radical emancipation from sin as described by Lessing. Human nature was, after all, characterized by radical even evil which would demand an eternal battle between the realm of goodness and the realm of evil only pointing to an infinite march of humanity towards the true invisible church. But this basic messianic claim of enlightenment to realize the messianic goal through reasonable action would not only determine the fundamental ambivalence between the secular and the religious, it would, in spite of its rhetoric of tolerance, in fact neutralize the traditional orthodox religion in a rather intolerant gesture, since the enlightened religion of political reason defined itself as the only true interpretation of this religion. I come to the second uh, issue, modern canon. And on this basis of radical messianic vision of the ideal society as the Christian kingdom of God, the Enlightenment period created at the same time its vision of past and history as the Trinitarian succession of three ages, namely the age of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, represented by Judaism, Christianity, and modernity. Long before this enlightened historiography of the three realms culminating in a third realm of messianic fulfillment was totally distorted by the National Socialist mega apocalypse of the Third Aryan Reich, it served as the messianic framework within which the Enlightenment created its own canon. Instead of the binary canon of the Christian biblical canon, enlightened culture created a ternary canon, including both Old and New Testament and the modern enlightened testament of freedom and emancipation. 
In the same way as Christianity interpreted itself then as the messianic fulfillment of Judaism, enlightened culture saw itself now as the messianic fulfillment or Hegelian aufhebung of Christianity. It was the Jewish philosopher and student of Kant, Saul Ascher, who in his polemical text, Eisenmenger der Zweite from 1794, pointed to the fact that enlightenment with its rational approach towards religion represented by Kant and Fichte was in fact not only a reduplication of the Christian messianic strategy of suspension, he saw that enlightened modernity was in fact even radicalizing the Christian attitude towards Judaism when it claimed that Judaism was not capable of a rational messianic adoption because of its legalistic character. Thus, Saul Asher pointed to a sincere problem when he radically questioned the idea of modern canon built on a messianic paradigm since it did not only suspend Judaism, but in fact excluded it from the new paradigm of modern culture. Modernity created its canon then not only as a double messianic suspension, but potentially as a suspension of Christianity alone, while discrediting Judaism as, as a whole now for not being secularizable, as it were, not being able to be secularized. From the perspective of this retrospective, uh, retrospective organization of history as a ternary canon, the problem of modern enlightened political theology becomes radically transparent. There could be no doubt that Enlightenment could never count on a Christian recognition as the Christian religion could never be accepted by the Jewish religion because of its messianic claim to be its fulfillment. Thus, for the first time, both religions found themselves in a situation of forced messianic adoption, which both could only respond to in an act of eschatological rejection. Against the principle of messianic suspension never accepted by the religion suspended, both philosophers and theologians of secular culture have demanded a reformulation of the relation between secular modernity and religion within the Christian context. They urged for a disentanglement of the messianic synthesis and synonymy of politics and religion as constructed in an enlightened political philosophy. The experience with political totalitarianism culminating in state terror and the creation of concentration camps for the supposed ultimate enemy of race or class, led Erich Wögelin in the early 50s and Hans Blumenberg in the later 60s to the conclusion that the quest for an absolute messianic knowledge and an absolute messianic action in history were nothing else but reinventions of agnostic form of an absolutism of thought and politics, but from opposite perspectives. The impossibility to realize the absolute messianic goal, Wögelin concluded, had to lead necessarily to the construction of an absolute enemy, the enemy of class or race, who by preventing this realization had to be eliminated. To avoid the catastrophic potentials of modernity, Wögelin, in his book The New Science of Politics from 52, 1952, radically dismissed with the messianic ambivalence of modernity and wanted to return to the classical order of the two realms created by St. Augustine in his famous De Civitate Dei. Modernity, which appeared to Virgilin only as a heretical gnostic form of orthodox dogmatic theology, was thus not only rejected in its messianic claims, it was in fact radically illegitimate. Against this gnostification of modernity, Hans Bloomberg, in his legitimacy of the modern age from 66, could recognize here only a new form of the classical delegitimization of modernity through theology, which led him to the opposite accusation that it was in fact theology itself that had the tendency to become a radical Gnosticism, and that modernity was nothing else but the result of a radical overcoming of Gnosis and all theology. We do not have to enter the virtuosic argument of Bloomberg, but he claimed that basically every theology which understood its concept of God had to think this concept precisely in the way that radical Scotism tended to do, namely as being potentially not only beyond reason and beyond being, but as well beyond goodness itself. A real infinite God could not only change the rules of his creation at any given moment, he could create a bad world if he only wished to. Against such an absolute epistemological emergency case, modernity had to radically defend itself by the Cartesian retreat into the realm of rational safety of the ego cogito. Blumenberg thus wanted to deactivate all possible derivations of modernity from theology in order to avoid a totalitarian taking possession of it. 
He was convinced that theology could only function as a Trojan horse, which in the dark night of crisis of the legitimacy of the modern age would free all its theological soldiers and absolutist ideologists in order to destroy the castle of modernity. Thus, Blumenberg responded to Wergelin's delegitimization with a counter-delegitimization. Both claimed at the end the other was a hidden Gnostic, and both pleaded for a radical detachment of religion from secular society. <coughs> Beyond the confusions of modern political theology, religion should now remain just orthodox, while secular society should secularize its secularity a second time in order to make it really secular and free it from all its secret religious leftovers. The crisis of modern political messianic theology would find its resolution then, according to Wergelin and Bloomberg, in the dismissal of the modern canon. Indeed, it seems to be no accident that Blumenberg, in his whole argument of the modern overcoming of Gnosis, leaned heavily on the Protestant theologian Adolf von Harnack. When this Protestant theologian had shown that canonic Christianity leaning on the double canon of Old and New Testament could only be understood as a defense against the Gnostic Marcionite tendency to eliminate old traces of the Jewish Old Testament from the Christian gospel, he at the same time in his book on Marcion from 1923 wished to adopt this very Marcionite Gnosis as the essential expression of true Protestant Christianity which could dispense then with its Jewish origins. The essence of a true and pure Christianity did not need, after 900 years, any legitimization through Judaism and the Old Testament. Indeed, both Harnack and Bloomberg seemed to adopt a similar strategy of purification of their essential gospel, which aimed at a strong resistance of all historical derivations from a for former paradigm. The true Protestant Christianity was all too similar to Blumenberg's pure and true modernity. The Gnostic paradigm thus did not only have its modern prehistory, it concerned in fact all the three elements of the modern canon, Judaism, Christianity, and modernity. As a radical rejection of messianic adoption, it left the three elements totally detached from each other. Modernity stood on its own when it created its new form of autonomous subjectivity. Christianity was supposed to return it to its original dogmatic faith and binary canon of, as Judaism was dismissed by modern Protestant Christianity in the same way it, it, as it was eschatolo eschatologically adopted before without consulting it, of course. Let us now have a short look at three different responses to this breakdown of the modern canon, a Jewish, a Christian, and a modernist response. All of them questioning the, its Gnostic collapse while striving at a post-Messianic reformulation of the modern canon. It is worthwhile to recall that the first chart protest against Gnostic modernity, namely against Harnack's pro program to detach Protestant Christianity from Judaism, was articulated by Jewish theologians. Leo Beck, Martin Buber, and Franz Rosenzweig, to name just the most famous Jewish theologians, strongly protested against the canonic secessio proposed by Harnack. Now, no doubt this protest had political origins as well. It seemed clear that the detachment of Christian theology from its Jewish roots would have political implications for the Jewish presence in modern German culture dominated by Protestant Christianity. Harnack aimed, in fact, at a new double canon of the New Testament and modern liberal culture as the political theological fundament for the Wilhelminian imperial Germany. Harnack, after all, played, according to the famous mean word of Franz Overbeck, the role of the theological hairdresser of the imperial wig. <laughs> but the Jewish theologians especially those who were involved in the project of liberal theology with its philological, historical critique and anti-dogmatic attitude, did obviously not only sense the political danger which seemed to be greater than the messianic suspension through Christianity, they recognized that Judaism had become part of a canon it never had acknowledged in its religious importance, at least officially. It was Franz Rosenzweig who summarized this relation after the collapse of liberal theology from the Jewish point of view as a kind of official and legitimate liaison where the two religions appeared, religions appeared as two competing ways towards the one religious truth. Reading the dominant Catholic intellectuals of the moderate interpretation of Vatican II, namely the theologians of the communio, communio circle around the Jesuit Hans Urs von Balthasar, it becomes clear that the awareness of the three issues, 
political messianism, Gnosticism, and Judaism, especially, of course, after the Holocaust, became central for what one could call the creation of a Catholic version of the modern ternary canon. Whatever one thinks about Pope Benedict XVI, it seems that this central representative of the Communio Circle has managed to formulate an impressive outline for the implicit Catholic understanding of the modern canon. One can find the echo of these reflections in the following contexts. In the rejection of the radical political messianism of the more radical fractions of the theology of liberation inspiration with its inspirations from Ernst Bloch, in his reconstruction of the Gnostic problem for modern theology and modernity as produced in the Regensburg speech, which nobody seems to have read beyond its initial insult of Islam, and in the reformulation of the Christian relation to Judaism, which in a sense seems to be the most far-reaching effect of this theological move. Since the issue of liberation theology is largely known, the argument of the Regensburg speech rather complicated, I shall only say, say a few things on Ratzinger's pro can post-canonical understanding of Judaism. He contended that the canonical relation defined by the Bible does not only allow for a reading of it from the perspective of Christ, in so far as Christ articulates the center and unity of both testaments. It leaves open the possibility to read the Old Testament as an independent and meaningful path, which, although it leads in Christian terms to Christ, in Jew Jewish terms can still be understood in its open view of the messianic issue. So Ratzinger seems to offer a possibility to adopt a position towards Judaism which in many ways resembles his position towards secular society, as developed in his debate with Habermas. Modernity has developed out of a Christian culture, but it does not coincide with its aims, nor can it detach itself from Christianity. The diachronic succession has to be counterbalanced then with a synchronic perspective where the partners involved do not lose their own independent character, while still depending on each other. Well, I'm close to my end. <laughs> Habermas's own position seems to be not only a result of the interest to define modern secular culture from within, like Blumenberg, namely without any need for external legitimization, but there can be no doubt that Habermas, very much like Ratzinger, had to cope with radical messianic political theology and with a rather new and special form of a messianic leftist exclusion of Judaism, both articulated in the most radical forms of the 68 students movement in Germany, of which Habermas was a member. When these students adopted radical messianic politics in their enthusiastic vision of the kingdom of God, they identified with Jewish radical messianic politics of Herbert Marcuse and Ernst Bloch on the one hand, but recognized in modern Jewish politics, especially Zionism in all its forms, the ultimate negative principle of the imperialist enemy on the other hand. So the reproduction of a radical messianic politics together with a leftist eschatological anti-Semitism obviously determined Habermas's moderate position concerning the need for a post-canonic definition of modern culture beyond its messianic and gnostic deviations. So I come to my uh, conclusions. These three different positions or points of departure seem to be highly relevant for the formulation of the post-secular relation as they grew out of the crisis of modern political theology, the modern canon, and the Gnostic threat. It is through the confrontation with the modern ternary canon that each of the involved canonical partners discovers its adequate identity beyond messianic suspension, Gnostic uh, detachment, or orthodox resistance. The idea of a post-secular relation between secular and religious society demands thus a reconstruction of the modern canon in post-canonic terms as a diachronic succession and a synchronic dialogue between independent partners. But since the post-secular relation defines the interrelation between religion and modernity first, it seems that the interreligious dimension of the post-secular relation presupposes the clarification of the first political relation. Therefore, it seems that only a religion and a modernity which have come to terms with the conditions of the post-secular relation seem to be able to enter into a dialogue with other religions without creating messianic superimpositions or orthodox resistances. Thank you. Dr. Weissman. I think from a disciplinary point of view, 
that we're actually shifting now from philosophy and theology into more uh, the social sciences. So it's probably good that I came between Professor Schmidt and Professor Bilo because um, my own training is really in uh, historical sociology. Now, I'm going to begin with a uh, quotation from The Feast of Fools by theologian Harvey Cox that was published some 42 years ago. And it's slightly longer than the other quotations that I'll bring, but I think, I hope you'll agree with me that it's worth devoting the time to this quotation. Will we destroy ourselves with nuclear bombs or with man-made plagues? Or will we survive as a precarious planet where a small affluent elite perches fearfully on the top of three continents of hungry peons? Or will we all end up in a subhuman world of efficiently lobotomized robots? Technology need not be the enemy of the spirit in the modern world, but it should be a means to man's human fulfillment, not the symbol or goal of that fulfillment itself. When we honestly ask ourselves whether we can have such a life-affirming world, we must move beyond mere optimism or pessimism, for the empirical evidence is either mixed or unfavorable. But we can hope. Hope, in the religious sense, rests in part on non-empirical grounds. Christian hope suggests that man is destined for a city, the capital C. It is not just any city, however. If we take the gospel images as well as the symbols of the book of Revelation into consideration, it is not only a city where injustice is abolished and there is no more crying. It is a city in which a delightful wedding feast is in progress, where the laughter rings out, the dance has just begun, and the best wine is still to be served. Now, Harvey Cox's questions, dating back to 1969, sadly seem no less relevant four decades later. Added to his litany of problems could be the crisis of post-Cold War capitalism, global terrorism, and irreparable damage to the environment. The question of the possibility of hope is perhaps even more poignant now than it was then. Can we still hope? In what? Hope can be seen as a response to despair, but is it a useful response? What is the relationship between hope and responsibility? And more specifically, how do these questions relate to Zionism and Jewish life in the state of Israel today? Now, you should know, of course, that all of us wrote lengthy papers and the challenge for this particular conference was to really try to extract the juice. Um, and most of our presentations are maybe, what, one-third or one-fourth of what we actually put together. It has been noted in our research group that hope for redemption is not necessarily the same as a belief in progress. We sometimes hope because of reality, but sometimes we hope despite reality. Still, I think it would be counterproductive to entirely decouple hope from reality. People often feel a need for concrete experience as a kind of evidence that their hope is well placed. The primary example of this I would submit is the Jew who hopes for redemption while on a weekly basis experiences the Shabbat as a foretaste of the world to come. The appealing description in Harvey Cox's statement that I read actually happens every Friday night in a traditional Jewish home. Feasting, singing, laughter, the best wine, and so on. 
and I've even been in homes where they dance. Without the weekly taste of Shabbat, it might have been difficult for Jews to sustain a messianic hope throughout, throughout two millennia of diaspora life. In addition to periodically experiencing what the future could be like, another way of sustaining hope is by re-experiencing the past. Hope is linked with memory. If memory shows that, for better or worse, the present is not like the past, then again, for better or worse, the future can be different from at least one of them. In Jewish festivals, time is experienced as spiral, cyclical, but with an upward thrust. Events are not only commemorated as having occurred in the past, but are also relived with a message for the present and the future. And here I'm going to quote our dear friend and colleague, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, who said, the freeing of the slaves, the exodus from Egypt that we celebrate on Passover, testified that human beings are meant to be free. Thus, the celebration of the Seder on Pesach is not simply a commemoration of an historical event, important as it may have been. It is also an active expression of hope for a different and better future. Many of the other Jewish festivals as well can be analyzed in this way. Hope has been characterized as not just an emotion, but an activity. Moreover, it is not only an activity in and of itself, it is also a requisite component of many other activities, indeed of human agency in general. Without hope, we might not be able to act. On the other hand, acting with hope does not imply any certainty as to the outcome of our actions. Waterworth claims that uncertainty is a central feature of hope, whereas perceiving matters as certain is a central feature of despair. <coughs> Acting in the face of uncertainty is characteristic of a number of biblical figures, and since we're um, already well into the first month of Adar, I'll mention most prominently perhaps Queen Esther, who famously said, v'chasher avadeti avadeti. In other words, that um, she's willing to go to the king and risk her life, and if she loses her life, then she loses her life. The outcome is uncertain, but she has hope. In this highly abbreviated version of my paper, we will consider Zionism as a form of translating the traditional Jewish hope for redemption into human agency through the assumption of responsibility for the Jewish people's destiny. Interestingly, a challenge to translators posed by Psalm 27 exemplifies the issue in a concrete way. In verse 14, the Hebrew reads as follows, Kaveh el Hashem, chazak v'yametz libecha v'kaveh el Hashem. And I, I will translate it, but the translation itself poses a difficulty. Although the first word of the verse, kaveh, can be rendered as hope in or put your hope in the Lord, many English editions published under either Jewish or Christian auspices translate the verse as wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. The difference between the two translations, hoping and waiting, is critical and explains much of the Sturm und Drang within modern Jewish history and specifically within some of the streams of modern Zionism. The great secular writer and Zionist thinker Yosef Chaim Brenner had called to his Jewish brothers and sisters, let us rise up and live without a Messiah. Some of the themes of Zionist activism were not foreign to traditional Jews. The national anthem of Israel, which before the establishment of the state was the anthem of the Zionist movement, is of course Hatikva, the hope. The Russian Jewish poet Naftali Herz Imber, who wrote the words, 
based himself on the well-known biblical passage in Ezekiel 37, known as the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, where the biblical text included in verse 11 the words, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, avda tikvatenu, Ember wrote, Odlo avda tikvatenu, our hope is not yet lost. Zionism held out a promise of hope for the Jewish people, particularly during the periods when they most needed it, and I would say beginning with the uh, pogroms, the late 19th and early 20th century, and of course culminating in the Holocaust. One of the main differences between the traditional Jewish belief in waiting for the Messiah and what Arthur Hertzberg characterized as secular messianism, namely Zionism, was precisely this point. Zionists took Jewish destiny into their own hands. Simply waiting and praying were not enough. There had to be practical human action, whether it be in the diplomatic, philanthropic, agricultural, or educational cultural realms, or sometimes in a combination of the above. Even the religious Zionists predicated their involvement in the Zionist movement on a certain acceptance of human autonomy. If they weren't actually bringing the Messiah, they were at least paving the way for his coming. Now, I was going to quote from Gershon Sholem's essay toward an understanding of the messianic idea in Judaism, but my colleague, Professor Middleman, beat me to it. Um, but I do want to say that I think an interesting point in the history of Zionism is <clears throat> that <clears throat> one of the early Zionist philosophers in the religious Zionist movement, Rabbi Rhinus, not a philosopher, but a leader of the Zionist movement, tried to completely divorce Zionism from any messianic uh, speculation. As I'll mention in a moment, the kind of um, catastrophic or utopian or apocalyptic messianism that you mentioned certainly became characteristic of another very, very important stream within religious Zionism. But the kind of rational model, the Maimonidian <coughs> model of Zionism, actually was not well developed, I think, in religious Zionist thought, because even someone like Leibovitch, whom I'll um, refer to in just a moment, also tried to divorce Zionism from Messianism. I mean, his view of Messianism was Maimonidian, but he did not apply that to his Zionism. So we really have, I think, relatively few thinkers within the religious Zionist movement who did develop that view. And I want to say one thing about Leibovitch, um, and maybe that's a bit of an answer to Professor Middleman's uh, quandary about uh, what happens if the world becomes too good, you know, is that sustainable? He said, Hamashiach tamid yavo, leolam yavo, meaning the Messiah will always come in the future. It's not that we're ever going to actually arrive at that. This is a, uh, a dream or a hope for the future. And what's important, first of all, I guess, is the process. And I don't know if Leibovitch would approve that. And I'm going to quote St. Teresa of Avila, but she said, all the way to heaven is heaven. But I think that the other thing that this messianic hope for the future provides is a kind of a yardstick or a benchmark against which to judge reality and to see how far along the road we've come. Now later, of course, the mainstream of religious Zionism became imbued with messianic fervor. This was due largely to the contribution of the single most important figure in the history of the movement, Rabbi Abraham Isaac HaKohen Cook, who years before the establishment of the state had used the phrase Midinat Yisrael, the state of Israel, and had seen the future state in kind of utopian terms as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. But it was actually his son, Rav Tzvi Yehuda Kuk, head of the influential Merkaz HaRav Yeshiva here in Jerusalem, who more fully developed this approach. 
Rabbi Cook, the son, saw not only the establishment of the state in 1948, which, of course, his father didn't live to see, and uh, concomitantly the, the Shoah. Uh, the father died in 1935. But also <clears throat> the near miraculous victory in the Six-Day War of 1967. During those heady days, the Jewish world was imbued with a euphoria that had not been known in a long time. From that point on, Cook and his followers proclaimed the state to be, quote, the pedestal of God's throne in the world, unquote. And when criticized for this messianic fervor, Rav Cook justified it by saying, it is not we who are forcing the end, but the end that is forcing us. Now, I'd like to problematize this approach. Or, as Gershon Sholem put it, what is the price of messianism? In a situation perceived as messianic, there is a reluctance to negotiate giving up any of the land, as well as a kind of mystical fervor that clouds over issues of realpolitik. A good example, I think, is the disengagement from Gaza in 2005, which many settlers refused to believe would happen at all until it was over, <clears throat> because some of the rabbis felt that we were in a messianic moment, and this couldn't possibly happen. The actions of the state, when you have this view, can become sanctified and take on cosmic meaning, and the enemy becomes a cosmic enemy. <clears throat> One of our challenges is that present reality doesn't fit neatly into the, the two categories by which Jewish history was traditionally understood. It is neither exile nor redemption. <clears throat> Excuse me. We need to develop new categories to describe our situation. Avieza Ravitsky has been very critical of the Messianists. They are in some ways, he says, not unlike the anti-Zionists, in that both groups are deterministic with regard to the future of the state. <clears throat> the anti-Zionists say the state is terrible and can't change for the good, and the Messianists say the state is the beginning of the flowering of our redemption and um, can't change for the bad, although I have to say that some of the Messianists in the last few years have been on a kind of an emotional roller coaster of up and down, what do you do with the Oslo process, with the disengagement, and so on. Um, <clears throat> for both groups, whatever the state becomes is not subject to our intervention for good or ill. Ravitsky prefers to see the present situation of the state of Israel not as a redemptive reality, but as a redemptive opportunity. The outcome depends on human actions. Ultimately, we will be able to designate a certain situation as having been the beginning of redemption solely ex post facto, or as expressed within the Jewish tradition, bidiavad. So do we know if we're living in pre-Messianic times? Well, we'll only know that in the future. We hope that Zionism in the state of Israel will be proven to have been not only an episode in history, but the beginning of a positive process for all of humankind to create a world of justice and peace. That depends first and foremost on human beings assuming responsibility for the future. So the question now remains of what importance is clinging to the messianic hope. The pitfalls of messianism have engendered among some Jews a counter reaction, a rejection of any messianic meaning to current events. So I've already indicated that one possible benefit of clinging to some notion of a messianic hope is as a benchmark or a yardstick. But I believe that messianism can also serve as a safeguard against two potentially destructive tendencies. On the one hand, human hubris, overweening pride in the ability of human beings to change our situation totally on our own. This recognition can help put things in perspective and give us a sense of our own limitations as human beings. On the other hand, it can also guard us against the opposite, which is deep existential despair, 
that can come of understanding how limited we mortals really are. The messianic belief gives us a sense that if we do our bit, there will be some assistance coming from another source. And I'd like, since I began with Harvey Cox, I'm going to end with Alice Walker. The only thing they have in common is that they're not Jewish, but <laughs> other than that, I think they're from different backgrounds and different disciplines. Really? Well, thank you for that important piece of information. I know that Harvey Cox is. In any case, Alice Walker wrote, and, and um, the book that I'm quoting is called, We Are the Ones We Have Been Waiting For, Inner Light in a Time of Darkness. I have experienced many difficulties and hardships in my life, and yet despair is a state in which I rarely remain for long. This is largely because despair cannot share the same place as wonder. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Bilu. Mark is sitting over there. Uh, this is a joint work, and I'm afraid entirely out of context in this conference, but uh, anyway. In terms of visibility and popularity, Chabad, Lubavitch, and Breslov Hasidic groups stand out among the uh, uh, religious groups in contemporary Israel. The two groups are uh, at the contrasting poles in terms of institutional organization and mystical orientation. Yet, their sharply divergent historical trajectories converge at the present moment. Since the death in 1994 of the seventh president of Chabad, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, here after the Rebbe, the movement has remained headless a situation which has been Breslov's way for the last 200 years, since the death of its founder, Rabbi Nachman. This similarity raises an intriguing question. How should we explain the growing popularity of these two leaderless communities, a sheer anomaly in Hasidism? Is the fact that Chabad and Breslov are headless relevant to the present success? Is it conducive to it? We seek to map the major parallels between Chabad and Breslov by focusing on their common inclination to un undermine established boundaries in the, in the orthodox world and to expand them in various domains. Our rationale is as follows. Border crossing in Chabad and Breslov is intimately related to their messianic orientation. <clears throat> More specifically, it is related to the messia messianic uh, status ascribed to the Rebbe and, less explicitly so, to Rabbi Nachman too. Glorifying the tzaddik as a messianic figure whose emergence undermines the historical whole order is incompatible with a, a leadership model based on succession. Therefore, both Chabad and Breslov are devoid of presiding tzaddik. We, we would like to argue that this oxymoronic absence turns into a virtue in the current period when rank and file Hasidim uh, have more space for initiative and autonomous activities. Epistemologically, boundary crossing in various domains might be conducive to making the absent tzaddik present by paradoxically transforming him into a closely felt and accessible figure in the life space of his followers without the constraints of a hierarchical mediation system. 
Methodologically, the comparison may appear tenuous. Breslev Hasidim are orphaned, so to speak, for more than 200 years, while Chabad Hasidim only for the last 17. Still, during most of its existence, Breslev was a small peripheral group fighting for mere existence. In fact, it was severely persecuted by other groups. <coughs> Only in the last generation did it become a popular movement. Chabad has always been a dominant group in Hasidism, yet its growth has been facilitated rather than halted following the Rebbe's disappearance. The messianic script is hotter in Chabad. The belief that the Rebbe is the Messiah is ubiquitous there. And many of those called Meshichistim, the radical messianists, flatly denies death. Both moderates and extremists in Chabad aspire for the Rebbe's revelation as the Redeemer. Most Braslavers resemble the moderates in Chabad, expecting Rabbi Nachman's revelation as the Messiah's harbinger or teacher and viewing his teachings as the key for universal redemption. Both Rabbi Nachman and the Rebbe came from aristocratic family in the Hasidic milieu, and in both cases, this noble ancestry was aggrandized by linking it to the house of David, from which the Messiah is supposed to come. Note also that the common root of their names, nun chet mem, the verb to, to comfort, lenachem, bears clear messianic connotations. In this messianic context, it, it is crucially significant that neither Rabbi Nachman nor the Rebbe had male offspring when they passed away. The Rebbe was, was childless, a situation perfectly matching with the myth of seven presidents in Chabad sealed with the coming of the Messiah. There are scholars who even claim that the Rebbe followed this myth by design. Rabbi Nachman, who maintained that the Messiah would come from his seed, was outlived by seven daughters, but his two sons, including Shlomo Ephraim, the holy baby, had died before him. And note that Ephraim, Shlomo, is son of Joseph, son of David, the two uh, Jewish messiahs. Both Rabbi Nachman and the Rebbe enjoyed an exalted position far beyond other tzaddikim. Rabbi Nachman did himself tzaddik for generations, tzaddik ledorot, and tzaddik of truth, tzaddik haemet. The Rebbe was the president, Nasi, in a movement where the president is everything, Nasi Wakol, and as Rabbi, Reish Bet Yud, acronym for Rosh Bnei Israel, the spiritual leader of all Jews, as against the doctrine of partial redemption of dynastic tzaddikim, pertinent only to their own communities, Chabad and Breslav embrace a universal notion of redemption. Now to boundary crossing the analytic core of the comparison. Messianic visions inescapably entail the collapse of established religious categories, which makes religious establishments ambivalent and wary. Jewish history has been dotted with notorious, from a Jewish perspective, messianic figures with subversive doctrines and tragic repercussions for the Jewish people. But even without embracing the issue of heresy in messianic uh, visions, boundary crossing appears as a pertinent conceptualization for studying the distinctive aspects of Chabad and Breslov that contribute to their growing popularity. Boundary crossing in Hasidism uh, is compatible with the idea of dispatching the sources, afatzat hamaya, not chutzah, uh, that is the outwardly distribution of the Hasidic mystical doctrine. Yet Rabbi Nachman in his time and the Rebbe were most prominent in the history of Hasidism in realizing this tenet. The universality of the messianic vision entails the most encompassing boundary crossing. It propels Chabad and Breslav to exhaust the Hasidic notion of breakthrough, paratsta, as a precondition for the coming of the Messiah. The redemptive messages dispatched by Chabad 
are designed for all human beings. Addressing non-Jews is limited to the seven Noahite commandments, but the very fact that such an address is on the movement's agenda is quite exceptional. The tenor of Breslov's messianic secret role, which was recently deciphered by my colleague uh, Tzvi Mark, is decidedly universal and is aimed at world peace. The universal scope of the messianic vision perforce encompasses other, less inclusive types of boundary crossing. First, Chabad and Breslov view all Jews, Orthodox, traditional, and secular, as their target. This inclusive orientation stems from the Rebbe and Rebbe Nachman's self-image as leader of all Jews, as against the sectarian authority of the traditional tzaddik. The most impressive manifestation of this orientation is the global activities of Chabad emissaries, shluchim, shluchim, uh, who, uh, uh, shlichim, seeking to cultivate Jewish, uh, 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 Jewish life wherever uh, Jewish reside or visit, from Tashkent to Marrakesh, from Cusco to Varanasi. The revolutionary nature of this project cannot be overestimated. Its rationale is twofold. First, all Jews are inherently linked to the general soul, the Rebbe. Second, kindling the dormant divine spark in the soul of each and every Jew generates a collective messianic awareness as a precondition for redemption. It is not surprising, therefore, that for many, Chabad appears as the representative of the Jewish people and the keeper of its legacy. Braslav Hasidim also actively uh, dis seek to distribute Rabbi Nachman's teaching in the widest circles possible. The two groups are engaged in publishing and aggressive marketing of the leader's teachings. Consequently, the two groups stand out in their unqualified readiness to absorb returnees, uh, what would be the pro more proper term, Ba'alei Tshuva, penitent, okay, born again Jews, <laughs> born again Jews, okay, uh, uh, okay, this is a, as a Christian ring, but anyway, arguably most Hasidim in Chabad today, and more so in Breslov, were not born there. Aside from their easier access to skills and practices imported from the secular world, these new Hasidim are motivated by religious enthusiasm and intensive search of spiritual and mystical experiences, and they tend to identify with the Rebbe and Rabbi Nachman as exemplary figures bigger than life. They certainly bolstered the messianic redemptive climate in Chabad and Brasla. The outer oriented activity of Chabad and Braslav entails boundary crossing in the sheer geographical sense and with, the all, with all the cultural passages entailed. Chabad houses, Batei Chabad, are scattered all over the globe. In Southeast Asia and South America, they provide assistance in varied matters, material as well as spiritual, to young Israeli backpackers and are much frequented by them. It seems that the Jewish house projects, Abayta Yehudi, erected by Breslav in India, Thailand, and South America, cater to the needs of the same catchment population. Note that the holy centers of Chabad and Breslav are far removed from the land of Israel. The holiness Rabbi Nachman's tomb, uh, of the Rabbi Nachman's tomb in Uman, in the midst of the a Ukrainian territory deemed tainted and impure by the Hasidim, stems from Rabbi Nachman's lively presence there. In the same vein, 770 Eastern Parkway uh, is saturated with holiness despite its location in a neighborhood dominated by Afro and Hispanic Americans because it was the Rebbe's abode. In either case, it is the tzaddik, the only man who endows the place with holiness. For the Meshichistim, the Messianists, in Chabad, 770, dubbed the house of the Messiah, is the diasporic equivalent of the temple. The pilgrimage to Rabbi Nachman's tomb is equated in Breslov with visiting the foundation rock 
in the temple, an axis mundi par excellence and the world's holier, holiest place. Another domain of signif significant boundary crossing is gender. In Chabad, and, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll skip some, some, some of the uh, examples. I'm wary about how much time do I still have. Um, another 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay, so I can go on. Uh, uh, in Chabad, the Rebbe led a project of female empowerment, encouraging women to study Torah, Kabbalah, and Hasidic thought. Using mystical arguments, he created an intimate linkage between redemption and Jewish women. Indeed, women are strongly represented, in fact, maybe over kind of, uh, presented among, uh, among the Messianic activists. Rabbi Nachman, on his part, uh, amply urged his followers to let their wives become full-fledged Hasidim. The female voice is loud and clear in Braslav's public gatherings and internet sites. Women in Braslav claim the right to maintain seclusions, it bodeduyot, practices of solitary devotion, as men do, and to go on pilgrimage to Rabbi Nachman's tomb. In so far as the ethnic boundary is concerned, Chabad and Breslau are the only Hasidic groups that accept Mizrahi Jews, Jews of Sephardic Middle Eastern background without reservation. To date, new immigrants of Mizrahi background constitute the majority in most of Breslau factions. Mizrahim are highly represented in Chabad too. Since Chabad and Breslau address all Jews, they constitute categories of identity which are less exclusive than in other Hasidic groups. One can be attached to Chabad even if one is not observant for the time being, as Chabadniks say, le'etata. <clears throat> uh, similarly, one can have a high regard for Rabbi Nachman and go on pilgrimage to his grave, thus becoming a part-time Bratlav Hasid while still maintaining another primary religious identity. These expensive identities reflect and at the same time reinforce the growing religious diversity in Israeli society and the weakening of sectarian demarcations there. The non-sectarian character of the two groups sharply contrasted with the segregated image of the Alta Orthodox society as a whole definitely adds to their popularity. Chabad and Braslav are Israelis despite the Hasidic attire and their appeal is bolstered by their universal vision and transnational flavor. Another boundary crossing has to do with Chabad and Breslov's readiness to adopt secular innovations related to science, applied science, technology, and art, and to harness them to their needs. In Chabad, the openness, this openness stems directly from its monistic, a cosmic theology, according to which all progress in science and technology is the manifestation of God's wills and presence. Chabad in particular is ahead of other ultra-Orthodox groups in employing visual media, the internet, and digital technologies. Note, however, that em embracing advanced technologies does not entail the adoption of its underlying scientific paradigms. On the contrary, the technological frontier is redelineated in mystical terms and the world is re-enchanted. Epistemologically, this selective adoption of modern technoscape, to use Arjuna Padura's terms, without heeding to modern ideoscape, may create new horizons of mystical religious imagination and experience out of the seemingly intolerable void of the tzaddik's absence. In both groups, this epistemological boundary crossing entails creative efforts to dialectically make the absent tzaddik present through constant maneuvering between actual and virtual reality. As noted, Chabad subscribes to a cosmic doctrine which denies the ontological validity of sense-informed reality, ascribing it exclusively to in the invisible divine essence. Braslav Hasidim are urged by Rabbi Nachman uh, to abandon the critical, rational uh, faculties in favor of innocent mind guided by imagination, creativity, 
and unbounded, unbounded uh, faith. Most significantly, both groups are adept in transforming their respective virtual dick into a close, strongly felt figure in private and public life spaces. This transformation is particularly noted among Chabad's Meshichistim, whose daily routine is shaped by their efforts to live with the Rebbe, Lichyot Imarabi, and to be with the Rebbe, Liot Imarabi, contacting the absent Rebbe through a bibliomatic, bibliomantic sorry, device, the oracle of the holy letters, Goral Igrot HaKodesh, <clears throat> which enables all supplicants to receive direct and immediate, Im immediate feedback from the Rebbe is quite widespread in Chabad. Based on the easy availability of the Rebbe's responses, the Messianists claim that he is more accessible now than he had ever been before. It seems that Chabad in particular has been invigorated by the magic of turning the invisible leader into a closely felt figure through a rich eco ecology of indexical, metonymic signs and ritual practices in which the Rebbe is accorded a, a central role as an active participant. Thus, the Rebbe is called to prayers in the synagogue in, 70, in 770 and receives aliyot for Torah reading. He continues to distribute $1 bills for charity and on festive occasions pieces of cake and glasses of wine. This embodiment is supported by visual technology, which makes Chabad's unprecedented visual culture akin to iconophilia. The virtual Rebbe has become more visible due to his omnipresent portraits, more accessible due to the widespread use of the Oracle of the Holy Letters, and also portable and embod embodied since he appears on various artifacts from key binders to visa cards and watches carried by the believers. I'm not one of them, but here you have an example. <laughs> and I have on me now about two or three more. But. <clears throat> so in, in, uh, uh, the, the, so the, the, the virtual leaders of the two groups have become the object of a wide, widespread personality cult but they are also experienced as present, accessible, and intimately close. And without a hierarchical organization that mediates between and separates master and disciples, all of the Hasidim have equal share in, in him, in the master. Personal attachment to Rabbi Nachman that involves an intimate confessional conversation with him is common practice in Breslov, a major component of its identity. The different historical periods in which Rabbi Nachman and the Rebbe were active entailed a dramatic, a dramatic gap in the potential for the com commemoration generated by the epistemological revolution of the camera. While the Rebbe's pictures are ubiquitous, pre-photography, Breslov lacked a visual representation of Rabbi Nachman, though this was uh, rectified recently by a revelation-based portrait, but it stirred a lot of controversy uh, in, in, in Breslov itself. Uh, Rabbi Nathan, Rabbi, Nachman, uh, Rabbi Nachman's senior disciple, uh, devoted much effort to enrich each and every commandment with meanings associated with Rabbi Nachman's spiritual essence, thus making him closer and more tangible. Many rituals were endowed with new interpretations that make it easier to incorporate them into the mythical life cycle of the tzaddik while others were coated with a new layer of meaning that assisted in substituting the lost visual memory with uh, embodied, with, with, with embodied, uh, um, with, with embodied memory more resistant for extinction. Uh, for example, sensing the close presence of the tzaddik by fixing one's gaze at the light of the Hanukkah candle. I'll need, I need, I'll need a few more minutes, please.
Let's compromise on three. <laughs> Rabbi, Rabbi Nachman's evocative stories and sermons and the personal conversa conversational style of his discourse have been conducive to turning him into a close engaging figure, all the more so as he was willing to daringly expose the vicissitudes of his inner world. To, to his uh, followers. The intimate nature of Rabbi Nachman's writings enables the reader to derive from them personal advice, thus drawing them closer to, the, to Chabad's holy letter, despite the divergence in literary genre. Note that the edited letters of the Rebbe constitute a huge corpus of instructions, practical advices, blessings and encouragements addressed to specific supplicants. Those reading them bibliomantically, so to speak, firmly believe that they received a personal answer from the Rebbe. In recent years, a new line of, okay, I'll, I'll skip it and uh, uh, just in, in by way, by way of, of, of conclusion, uh, the, the smiling faces and enthusiasm of Hasidim in both groups are informed by their messianic visions and father reinforced them. As against the nostalgic yearning for the past, the future-oriented messianic messages provide the Hasidim in Chabad and Braslav with an optimistic perspective and a utopian worldview. Against traditional conceptions of apocalyptic messianism uh, and, uh, emerging from catastrophe, uh, in the two groups, the era of redemption will be uh, realized through messianism of success. The crux of our comparative analysis is the argument that in both Chabad and Braslav, the absence of the tzaddik does not prevent the Hasidim from bonding with him and emulating him. Uh, they are equipped with very tools for making the absent tzaddik present, accessible and communicable. The painful absence of the saints is neutralized and even turns into a virtue due to these tools, some of which are clearly associated with modern technology. The significant gap between the Hasid and tzaddik, another boundary, if you will, can more easily be traversed when the tzaddik is virtual. Such a virtual rabbi is shared by all Hasidim. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bilou. Um, we left uh, a significant amount of time uh, for questions and answers, uh, and I would like to proceed as follows. Let's um, let's devote very elegant analysis for. Uh, th 30 minutes to questions and answers about papers and responses in this session. Uh, and because we had to uh, shorten some of the questions and answers and discussions of the previous sessions, we'll leave 10 minutes um, after we discuss this session to, to, for questions to any of the uh, presenters during the course of this conference. And then I'll present some concluding remarks. And uh, we should be able to, uh, to adjourn at 6 o'clock as planned. Um, so so um, uh, we'll proceed as follows, uh, as we did in the past. The first uh, round of questions will, uh, will go to uh, people within the Institute and uh, fellows at Van Leer. And then we'll open it up to the Kahal. And I would just say, uh, Professor Bilou, uh, uh, Dr. Weissman asked what I thought was a, was a an interesting question. She wanted to know if they give the uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe an Aliyah in shul, do they also give him Hagba? <laughs> okay. Uh, Rav Riskin. Uh, 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 we have the mic. We have the portable mic. David. Do you think that messianism within Chabad is growing or lessening? Messianism. The Meshachiyut of the Rebbe. Growing or lessening? Well, okay, well, let's, let's take okay, a few sorry. questions and then, you, then can you respond. Uh, Yehuda. Right. Um, two questions. One. Right. Uh, two questions. One for Alan Middleman. Um, one aspect of the Maimonidian messianic tradition um, that I, I don't think you mentioned is 
Um, oh, by the way, just in, in terms of your list of rational messianists, um, I, don't, I, don't, you know, I don't know if he appears on your list, but actually I think Arav Uziel and some stuff fits in, fits in that category as well. Um, I don't think you touched on, um, in, my, in Maimonides, sort of the internalization of messianism, sort of the way in which Olam Haba becomes, becomes an internal reality um, and, and the social and political dimensions of messianism are then redefined as the reasonably just and stable social order that can then facilitate that, which I'm, it may be that for Maimonides it entails this like transformation to a society of saints, but for him, I'm not quite sure that it does. Um, and, and so I, I, you know, I, I just wonder how that affects your, your perception of, of realistic messianism. And also in, and in the Maimonidean exception, you know, the place for him of the Beit Din Hagadol, the great institution of legal reform and legal change, sort of what effects, if any, that, that has, on, and maybe that's trivial. Um, in response to uh, uh, Professor, Bilu's, Professor Bilu's presentations were always um, fascinating, thought-provoking, uh, and given the um, sort of the, the situation, you, you said that at the outset that you weren't sure how relevant uh, your, your paper was, but one has to ask, and here actually I, I would ask the question, I'd be delighted to hear, frankly, from um, some of our, our Christian colleagues, or as we call them at Harvard Hill, alternatively covenanted colleagues. Um, uh, um, when you hear these descriptions of Chabad and Breslov, frankly, how familiar does it sound, if you know what I mean? Because, of course, within the Jewish world, that's... You know, particularly sort of, a, you know, Chabad has attracted, it's no accident, of course, that the most powerful internal critic of Chabad is none other than David, Professor David Berger, who's a leading historian of Jewish Christian polemics of the Middle Ages. Um, and, and so if you feel like addressing this, I just think we'd love to hear how all of this sounds. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyone else from within... Uh, Naftali, uh, we'll take Naftali, then we'll have a round of answers, then we'll go to David, and then we'll open it up. Uh, uh, again, to uh, 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 to, uh, to Professor Bilu and Zvi uh, Mark, uh, it was amazing comparative uh, work, uh, and we like, I like to learn more and to, to see more of the details. But only something that you, of course, know, but only to remind us that the theology of both movements are basically enormously contradict. Sure. Because we speak about uh, uh, the, the Chabad uh, approach is uh, pan and entheistic. It's a total emanation that continue. And the, the, the representative, God is representing everything, even in artificial things like the desk and say God exists everywhere and in accordance uh, to, uh, to uh, Breslav, uh, God hide his face so it stopped the emanation and, uh, and we are living under the darkness of uh, seven uh, skies of uh, darkness. So uh, and even so they are so close practically when you analyze them and compare them. Can I say them. that they are at the contrasting poles in their mystical orientation? That's what I meant, partly. I didn't have time to develop no, no, it's okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, David, you want to ask your question now? Uh, yeah, in terms of, uh, of uh, Dr. Weissman's uh, uh, paper, uh, you use the term apocalyptic messianism. And I think that that has to be very carefully uh, parsed. Um, what I understand by apocalyptic messianism is precisely what apocalyptic means, coming down from, from heaven, which means that apocalyptic messianism basically says that there's absolutely nothing human beings can do to bring about the coming of the Mashiach. The best they can do is simply uh, hold the fort, so to speak, and not uh, disintegrate until until the Mashiach uh, comes. But, the, but anybody who tries to force it is, is in the category of Doche Ketz. Uh, so in that way, this is... Now, un, 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 fortunately, the, 
the, the opposite of that, a type of messianism that can be brought about by, by, by uh, uh, human efforts and whatever, um, is attributed to Maimonides. Uh, but actually, if one really looks at Maimonides' notion of eschatology in the, in the large sense, it's clear that the, that the, that the true thrust is the Olam Haba, which is Matsui Omeid Tamid. It is clearly not historical. And if you look, and I think much has been, too much has been made of chapter 12 of Hilfot Malachim, where this is something the Rambam says, yes, if this happens, it happens, but I don't see any, I don't sense any messianic urgency there whatsoever. He's something, this, this is a possible, it could be, but meanwhile, we do the best we can now. Uh, but it's the, even the Mashiach, right at the end, he gets a little kind of utopian uh, and whatever. But the true telos, I mean, the true thing that, it, that one aspires to is is the Olam Haba, which is the realm of the eternal, where at that point uh, the Rambam, as a Platonist, is uh, patently evident. Okay, let's, um, let's give it a chance uh, to, to the uh, authors to respond to some of the questions. Um, is Messianism growing? Did you... Yeah, it's, it, this is an empirical question, which is not easy to answer, uh, but uh, I, I would say, based on kind of impression only, that uh, within the old guard, it might be declining, but since uh, there are so many new immigrants to the movement, uh, mostly, uh, and they are ardently Meshichistim, uh, I think that messianism is still there, even though you know 17 years <laughs> historically is 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 is, uh, is too too thin to 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 make to make to make predictions. Messianism is still quite um, energizing, animating among the young generation, and and uh, so it, time will tell. But it's still alive and well. 770 is held by the Meshechistim. As you know, uh, uh, to you, though, just mm -hmm. I, I would I, I would like to just to comment that Chabadniks who are usually uh, equipped with kind of historical awareness are, are quite aware of the similarity. I would say that they are they are uh, uh, forced to walk in this discourse in in, in this course. Uh, they would like to uh, separate themselves from it, but but. The, 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 the dynamics of, of, of a Messiah that lived, had lived and died and resurrected forced them, I would say, to follow in many ways. I didn't have time to go, sorry, to go into it, uh, to follow the Christian pattern. Mm -hmm. Any of the Christians like to uh, respond to Yehuda? Uh, Dr. McDermott. I, I, despite the fact that we called you rabbi last <laughs> night, you still qualify as a Christian. Well, I would just say that I was, while I found characteristics fascinating, I am struck more and more by the dissimilarity since the disciples of Jesus said, hey, we had breakfast um, with him. We put our fingers into the holes in his hands and his feet. And, and and these were in the days after he rose from the dead, and 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 so that that um, testimony of of physical experience with a risen body um, strikes me as so dissimilar from these claims that that that's my first response. May I expose an anecdote, or we must be only very serious? No, no. Please. Thank you very much. It's not yet the Messianic era, but I will allow it. <laughs> okay. So, no, it's to you, Dab. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a huge conference uh, with a lot of bishops and cardinals, I was asked by the bishop of uh, Mar Marseille, uh, he, he asked me, tell me, Rabbi, this uh, Chabad Lubavitch, they say that the Messiah came, and he was green and very happy. I said, listen, once was a Jew. His name, you call him Saint Paul. He came to us and said, "The Messiah come," and we throw him away. And look what happened. So now, when Jews are coming and say to us, 
the Messiah come and say, you are wrong, but you stay with us. You are not going anywhere. Okay. Uh, Rav Riskin, did you, want to, did you have a comment to, to one of the remarks? No? Okay. Um, and uh, uh, Professor Novak's uh, comment about uh, apocalyptic messianism and the Rambam kind of de-emphasizing messianism in favor of, of um, the eschaton, meaning immortality. Just, um, it's true that Maimonides speaks very strongly about the world to come, and that seems to be his real uh, notion of the good that's going to happen. I think you note very correctly, because that's what he was all about. Very platonic, very, you know, very uh, spiritual, intellectual. However, I think it's important to note that all of the religio-legal compendia that we have, certainly the overwhelming majority, do not speak about the days of the Messiah as part of their compendia. It begins with getting up in the morning and the laws of what you recite in the morning, and it ends with the laws of mourning. It never talks about the end of the days. Maimonides does. And I believe he does because he feels that's the telos that Dr. Quinn spoke about earlier of the whole halachic experience in order to lead to this. So that the kind of uh, near perfection of the world order, for me it's very important, and I think that that's probably the greatest um, guard against what I consider to be the Lubavitch heresy and the Bratislavian heresy is, is a much more kind of normative messianism. You don't need it. You don't have to go crazy about it. And it can be done in normative situations. I think it was very, very important to my Maradian thought within this world. I don't think it's secondary at all. Just, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, we could differ on that, but I, I would simply indicate that if the purpose of the Messiah is basically to establish, whether it's in its Noahide version or full Sinaitic version for everybody, the, the Torah uh, as the constitution of an optimal society which will have worldwide influence, then it would seem that the Messiah is the means to that end. In other words, that the instantiation of the observance of the, of the mitzvot by Israel and, uh, and all others, you know, at the end, of, or, you know, have an, it will be more than just a leader of this optimal society. It will be, have universal influ, uh, influence. But very clearly that the purpose of it is, is not that the purpose of keeping of the law is for the sake of the Messiah, but the Messiah is to, for the full implementation of the Torah, which is impossible uh, uh, thereon, which means it gives a very normative uh, uh, goal to it, which is contrary to uh, um, uh, th this notion that somehow or other uh, the Messiah can be brought about by uh, human beings ep exercising virtual supernatural powers. That, that, and that, I agree with you, is the heresy of uh, the, the Lubavitch and uh, probably brought some of it, but certainly Lubavitch. Uh, Dr. Weissman. Yeah, uh, just two very brief <clears throat> responses. Uh, first of all, thank you to Professor Novak for the comment. I was basing myself on the article by Gershon Sholem that Professor Middleman quoted. Um, and I think he used the term apocalyptic in terms of a messianism that is discontinuous with history as we're living it as distinguished from continuous, right? Now, um, I know that rabbinic literature is full of descriptions of ikvata de Meshicha, what the world is going to be like in the footsteps of the Messiah. And I think here again, as I go back to a, a question I asked you yesterday, I think that the um, when you live in Israel, 
um, these questions take on a uh, an urgency that perhaps they they're not as important or on a day-to-day -day basis when you live in the diaspora because we have people in our society who are convinced that we are living in the footsteps of the Messiah and the question is what does that mean how do you respond to that what to what does that obligate you so I will definitely have to go back to the paper and try to incorporate your comment the second thing that I want to incorporate is just from Yehuda's question about interiorized messianism and here I don't have time to go into it but actually in some of the secular Zionist movements there's an emphasis not on the redemption of the people or the land so much as gulat adam the redemption of the human being and that is a kind I think of an interiorized messianism and I think specifically of someone like Aleph Dalit Gordon but there were many others so I think that that also I'll have to incorporate in the final paper Okay, Alan. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you, Huda, for his comment. I don't deal with it in my paper. I trip over my mind these very lightly, uh, sort of as a setup for these modern thinkers. Um, but if uh, we have a chance, again, a final chance for revision, this is something I could take up. There's a very strong uh, internalization of Messianism, of course, in Hermann Cohen, the strongest sense one could imagine. Um, and with, um, with uh, uh, Professor Novak's point about uh, Maimonides and Olam Haba as a final stage above and beyond the Messiah, um, I think one of the uh, advantages of Len Goodman's account over Cohen or Schwarzschild is that he takes that up explicitly and he sees Messianism as ordered by yet something higher, which gives Goodman, I think, a much richer, more complicated, more interesting uh, uh, picture than you got in these neo-Kantians. Well, the, the, that, that, that might you know, very well be true, but I mean, we can deal with Hermann Cohn's uh, message of some other time. But with Maimonides, very clearly, Olam Haba, the, and the Rivet pointed this out very clearly, Olam Haba is not temporal succession. It's totally atemporal. It's Matsui ve'omed tamid. It is this eternal realm of which Olam Hazer is just a, a kind of a brief interlude uh, there and very, very platonic. Uh, the Mashiach is entirely different. This is a political desideratum, not as an end in itself, but it will be the best means for the full implementation of the Torah as the law of uh, universal law. Uh, I, I understand. I was talking about it in a temporal way because... The days of the Messiah are temporal, yeah. but there's still something higher. It may be constant, yeah. but it's, it's higher. But, but Hermann Cohn also, by the way, in his messianism, has a terrible problem. He's arguing against Hegel when he wants an, an ideal that is unrealizable. Yeah. Uh, and what does he do with the, the notion of the Messiah? Uh, because it's, it, it, and that's his reaction to Hegel's secularization of a certain kind of Jewish messianism. Well, as I say in my paper... What Cohen's concept of an infinite deferral ultimately gets him is ought implies can't, which is a bad place for a Kantian to be. Okay, let's, let's open up the floor uh, to questions from, from the Kahal. Uh, please, I, I ask you to uh, you know, keep it short, ask a question, and direct it uh, to a specific person, and please identify yourself. Peter Pellach from the Elijah Institute, and I'm fascinated. Debbie used the word yavot, mid yavot, but nobody talked about yitmamea, that he's always going to be delayed. And the question that occurred to me listening to all the presentations was that there's a question of how much time, how much patience do we have? I thought of it in terms of Chabad, and, and it referred to one of the earlier questions. Is it growing or is it going to die out? It's fascinating in terms of, of the followers of Nachman that they've maintained it for so long, but is it a constant revival or is it something that's been maintained? Certainly with secular Zionism, I see, um, if you like, uh, uh, the, the signs that people have lost patience with the secular Zionist stream, and I certainly think in the post, this question of post-religious world, it, the secular world is notoriously impatient. So the question I, I really wanted to ask is, is um, a messianic hope and the sort of hope that you all refer to, 
only really sustainable in a world of deep faith because the it needs to be sustained over a very long period of time or does it have a, an end do we give up hope are there questions yes the gentleman in the back The Jews believe, I know what to do. The Jews believe two things. Number one, that the land. But the, the, land yeah. was, the land was given to the Jews. Secondly, the Jews believe that the Torah was given to the Jews at Sinai. That peace process between <coughs> the Jews and the Arabs has been a sham. That's a fact. Okay. Similarly, I'm sorry to Do say... Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm going to come... Uh, okay, to please. The, point. Uh, the common mission, the bond between Jews and Christianity somehow will not work because they are diametrically opposed like the Sinai as the Torah was given. For many reasons, self-interest, <coughs> uh, destiny, I'm so forth. What I'm trying to say is, it's fine to have discussions. However, let's be honest, honest. Until we all believe that God is one, then this is just sitting here. Okay, what, what is your question? Uh, what, what is your question? Therefore, the question is, why sit? It's fine, brotherhood, uh, fraternity, but what is the purpose of eschatology means, the end of the days? If we have different beliefs in the end of the days, then it's not practicing the religion that the Jews practice, and it's not practicing or worshiping one God. Okay. Yes. Right. Gentlemen, and then we'll Anyone go for a round of answers. answers. No? I have one question for the Professor Bill. Let me continue. I have one question for the Professor Bill. Okay, I have one question for Professor Bilou. What do you analyze the success of uh, messianic movement in Abad and uh, Breslev, like a, a revitalization of messianism in Jewish history, or another uh, question, another uh, concept? For example, uh, um, you you, sp you spoke about the success of uh, messianic uh, Abad and Breslev in uh, Jews of Arab countries from Arab countries. Uh, for you, it's just economic sociologic reason or another concept? Because, of, for example, the Kabbalah is more present in the Jewish uh, messianic Sephardic uh, life. And what do you think about uh, It's not just historical or sociological reason to explain this phenomenon. Okay. Um, and uh, just, uh, I, if I could just add to that, I have a question for Professor Bilu. You talked about boundary crossings. Would you like to discuss at all the boundary crossing that, I, I don't know if it is true amongst the breast lovers, but I know it's true in Chabad, that the Rebbe was indeed interested in talking to, gen, to the Gentile world as B'nai Noach or whatever. So that was a huge boundary crossing from Hasidic circles into, into being concerned and having relationship in some sense with the non-Jewish world. Um, Okay. Uh, uh, respond to the first question about whether hope can be indefinitely sustained um, in the absence of faith, I think you, was your qualifier. Um, it, it, it seems to me that we, we are um, genetically selected for hope. Okay? The, the uh, despairing uh, Cro-Magnons died off around the campfire when they 
you know, the ones who said, yeah, we're going to go out and get that mastodon. Biological optimism. Yeah, their genes carried on, and the ones who said, oh, it's too big, it's too fast, they died out. So in some way, we're, we're hardwired for hope, not to trivialize the issue. But the question is whether um, robust public or social hope is possible. We're always going to be people who have some degree of private hope for our children, for ourselves, for our careers, for our marriages, and so on. Um, I think that um, big hopes, either uh, social public hope or the hope of um, whole cultures, uh, religious hope, messianic hope, uh, it can only be sustained on the back of uh, small experiences of hope. Um, when we invest, uh, when we make ourselves vulnerable, and we invest in persons, in things, in projects, and when they flourish, and we see that empirically, to some small but real degree, hope uh, is, is justified, is vindicated, I think that sustains it. So um, I, don't, I, I, I think that you're right in the long run that uh, large cultural, social, public hope uh, in a very robust sense, is not possible without religious faith. But I think there is a modest empirical or phenomenological component that's so necessary and very, very realistic. I, I just want to pick up on that. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, to what was just said. And, and I mentioned the Shabbat as one of those experiences. Um, but I, I certainly disagree completely with the gentleman who suggested that the peace process is a sham and so on and so forth. I think that meetings that I've had, for example, with Palestinians in dialogue is another kind of experience that shows you how things could be. So these little building blocks, and if I began with a quote from 1969, in 1968 on the Columbia University campus, I was a student then, um, we had a, a student revolution. And um, some of the students would organize what's called TGIF, thank God it's Friday, and they'd have balloons and ice cream and music. And I remember the Trotskyites who were really not pleasant people, <laughs> and the Maoists, they were even worse, they would say, Never were, uh, Debbie Graham. How can you eat ice cream while we're trying to make a revolution? And the other student said, if I can't have ice cream, I don't want a revolution. <laughs> and, and I thought, this is a marvelous example. And as a matter of fact, what do we as Jews do? Every week we have a TGIF party. Thank God it's Friday. And, you, and I completely agree, you have to structure experiences on a day-to-day -day or week-by-week -week or at least a few times a year basis where you experience how life could be different, how we could be in dialogue. And I would have to say that even this kind of a conference of Jews and Christians meeting together and talking about common concerns is another example of this kind of experience. Addressing your question, uh, well, I mentioned that, that Chabad is oriented towards the Gentiles and the Noahites' uh, co uh, commandments are, are uh, relevant. Um, I, yes, there is. Was this connected to, to the Messianic dream in it's some way, or was it just good no, politics? No, I, I believe that everything that the Rebbe did, the Rebbe, whether the Rebbe considered himself the Messiah or not, it's debatable, but that he had a very elaborate messianic consciousness from the, at the outset, and that all his activities, particularly the, the, the shlichim, the, the emissary project, was meant to bring forth uh, redemption is, um, is, 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 is very clear. And so, so this was also part of this grand project. By the way, uh, he, he, his, his portrait adorns a U.S. Congress medal, and his birthday was, uh, uh, I think, uh, Reagan uh, made it into a education day or some day of education uh, based on, 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 these, on these preaching. So here we have another interesting Jewish-Christian uh, con convergence. As, as to, uh, uh, and and if, if you go through the West Bank, uh, 
you can find posters in Arabic which says in Hebrew, in Arabic, Yechi Adonenu, Rabenu, Morenu, Yaish, Yaish, whatever, in Arabic. And so, so yes, they address the Palestinians. Can I translate that? Uh, 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 long live our Rebbe, Master, and Mes King Messiah, uh, in Arabic, in order to inculcate this idea among the Palestinians. Uh, as for uh, Mizrahim, let me just share with you an anecdote. The, the, the trigger for this paper uh, by Tzvi and myself was a visit to Baba Sali's tomb in Netivot uh, two years ago. Uh, Baba Sali is uh, a Jewish Moroccan venerated saint. Uh, and, and we, I, I studied Jewish Moroccan saints many years ago and I, I haven't been there for a long time and then when we came there we were really very surprised to find out that uh, booths and posters were Rabbi Nachman and the, uh, and the Rebbe were clearly overrepresented. Abba Sali was there too, but uh, the Rabbi was all the more so. So <laughs> this was the trigger. Why does it happen? Uh, well, uh, it, you, you're right. I mean, um, Moroccan Jews, in particular North African Jews, are more mystically oriented, but we should... Uh, take into account that, that uh, Chabad and Braslav are m mystically oriented movements and they, they uh, so, so it's, it's an East European uh, mystic, mystical movement. Uh, the personality cult, I think, is, is a convergence point, but uh, on, 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 uh, from, from a sociological perspective, the fact is that Chabad and Braslav are the only, the only Hasidic groups who uh, without, without uh, any, any, any reservations, are ready to accept Mizrahi. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, if I could answer the gentleman in the back, uh, who made a, an empirical claim that Christianity and Judaism are diametrically opposed, that's an empirical claim. Um, I would just say that this, we have a disagreement here. You are on one side, and on the other side is Maimonides, and. Uh, Rabbi Moshe Rifkis, the Baragola, and Rav Yaakov Emden, and Rav Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, and uh, the Sri Deish, Rav Weinberg, and Rav Cook, the father. So it's a disagreement, and you're on one side, and these other rabbinic authorities are on another. And let me just, rather than to cite authority, I'll, I'll cite an anecdote, which I think says a lot. Many Orthodox Jews ask me, why do I work with Christians? Why do I want to work with Christians? So I say, look, do you believe in Torah Min Shemayim? Do you believe in Revelation? And they say, yes. And do you believe in the concept of a chosen people? And they say, yes. And do you believe that the Torah is a divine document that makes a claim on your life? And they say, yes. And do you believe that you have to obey the Torah even when it runs counter to contemporary mores? They say yes. And then I ask them, when you go out of this orthodox enclave, when you go out of this little intimate orthodox community, who can you talk to who also believes that? And the answer is pious Christians. <laughs> that's not a joke. I think that's an empirical reality. So, so what we have here is we have to shed some stereotypes and some factually inaccurate assumptions that we have about the other. Um, the gentleman in the back, yes, a question, please, yes. Uh, of course, prior to, the, prior to the question, there's a very short point I want to take. My wife is Egyptian, Sephardic. We don't see too many Sephardic people here. The first thing my wife asked me, why to make Aliyah, I said, the Goyim hate us. She said, who are the Goyim? I said, the Christians. So my wife said, Christians are not Goyim. The Muslims are the Goyim, because Christians have the same God, same Torah, and Messiah is a Jew. The bottom line, this is what my wife told me. By the way, my wife is Rachel Lipkin. She is a Kashev at the monitor for Kol Israel. She listens to them. She's listening to them right now. And the bottom line she grew up with in Egypt 20 years was we kill the Jews on Saturday because they're the Saturday people. We kill the Christians on Sunday because they're the Sunday people. And one of the things about Maimonides, and I love Maimonides, but he lived in a Muslim world. He lived in Spain, Morocco, the Holy Land, and in Egypt. He could not speak against Islam because he would be killed. And indeed, he converted to Islam according to the Muslim right. world. You have a question. The question is, if, if 
and this is to uh, Dr. Weiss, um, Weissman, yes. Um, if you had meetings with the Palestinians, which is okay, I've met with Palestinians too, but if their God is another God, and this is something we should discuss here, their God is the God of, of Ishmael, the, the opposite, the antithetical forefather of the Judeo-Christians. And if their program is in a triumphalist, exclusivist plan for the abolishment of Judaism and Christianity, how can we talk to these people? It is well, it, excuse me. Can I, I, as chairman, I would like to just rule out this question because that's simply not the subject of this conference. We're not here to discuss Islam. We're here to discuss theological and moral and social issues between Jews and Christians. We are not qualified, at least the panel here, is not qualified to make authoritative statements about Islamic theology. Well, okay. on this question, I think we are. Islamic theology? On this particular question, there is only one God, but different people call that God by different names, and some people call that God Allah, and I call that God Hashem, and other people call that God uh, the triune God, or sometimes Jesus. But it's not the same persons. God. It's there is only one God, so it's got to be the same no, God. No, it's Satan. Allah is Satan. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, the, 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 we have time for one more question. This gentleman on this side. A uh, question to whom is my concern. Uh, what is the moral Christian Jewish common basis of human mission in the image of God? Is it understood? Is it the Ten Commandments? It is the, the hidden roots of the Ten Commandments? Is there any workshop that we can dialogue on this basis? Any, any is there a Christian, a Christian response, and then we'll have a Jewish response to that. Anyone like to? Oh, he, he, he Professor said. McDermott. Well, I think there's tremendous common ground morally between Christians and Jews. Uh, as was uh, said just a few minutes ago, um, um, Christians believe Tanakh is from God. And not only the Ten Commandments, but all of, of Torah, certainly, and Christians believe also Tanakh, uh, all of these books are explications in one form or another of the Ten Words. So... Um, I, 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 I think that's tremendous grounding. And Christians believe with Jews that all human beings are made in the image of God. Naftali. Uh, actually, excuse me that I will speak in this way, direction. Uh, the effort of, of the work in our group uh, during the last two years that expressed in, uh, in, uh, in the full uh, papers that you can see in, on the site of this conference, uh, try to find uh, answers and presented answers to your question. And uh, there is several directions and ideas about the common denominators uh, between Jews, Christians, and maybe Muslims, and maybe other people then, and uh, there is a lot of ideas. We just in this uh, uh, session we heard some, and in the sessions before and yesterday. And as I said, in details we can read it in the papers, uh, which is the outcome of the work of this group. Uh, I want to suggest something that is very clear: the 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 basis for the common uh, ground for Jews and Christians is the willing of Jews and the willing of Christians to find a common ground and to speak on the same common ground. So the, the willing is, the will is the common ground. And those who doesn't will or refuse, they refuse, they refuse, Nick. Those who want, it will be. It, it's happened already. 
Okay, thank you, Natali. Uh, I just, there, there was a second part to that question in terms of are there seminars or practical um, uh, opportunities to pursue this. Uh, indeed, there are. Um, that's one of the reasons that uh, Rav Riskin started his Center for Christian Jewish Understanding and Cooperation uh, in Efrat. You can get a, a brochure of the center on your way out at the registration desk. Deborah, Dr. Weissman heads a group of um, Christians and Jews uh, on an international level. Uh, we have uh, Mrs. Ann I alone here, who's also involved uh, in starting up a center for Christians uh, and Jews education. So there are opportunities, and um, I hope you, you can find them. Just a few brief concluding remarks. Um, first and foremost, I would say that um, we are indebted to so many people that made this possible. Um, and uh, Hakarat HaTov is a, is a primary uh, Jewish and I believe a human uh, responsibility to acknowledge uh, the goodness that uh, others give us. Um, and first and foremost, I would say uh, it started with the hope of Rav Riskin, who unfortunately had to leave evidently, um, who had the hope many years ago of starting a Jewish-Christian dialogue or center in, in Israel. And I have to admit that when he called me about this and he told me of this over the phone, um, I didn't say this to him because he's my teacher, but I thought that he was either sleep deprived or he had a bad dream that night. And I said, I, I, I thought that, well, you know, maybe Gamze Yavor, this will pass, you know, and he'll come to his senses. But like many things, he, re he converted me to the, to, to the great blessing of, of doing this. So first and foremost, none of this could have happened without the dreams and the hopes of, of Rav Riskin. Um, and on a, on a more practical level, uh, we all owe a, a great debt of thanks to Gabi Mutskin, who's the president of, of Van Leer, who was so supportive in doing this conference, and certainly to um, Naftali Rotenberg, who, uh, who was in many ways the driving force behind this, and uh, to Daphne Schreiber, Daphne's here, you know, there's something that I call the Acropolis Syndrome. When you go to Athens and you go to the Acropolis and you look up and you say that the Greeks were such geniuses, they were able to build this art, art, architectural perfection, this building that's so perfect. And what you don't realize is all the hard work and the, that the slaves had to do or the servants had to do, dragging the stone. You see the product, but you don't see the process. Without the process and the hard work of the process, you don't have the product. And Daphne uh, Schreiber was... was uh, absolutely essential to that, as was uh, Shira Karagila. So uh, we owe them a great debt of thanks. And, and of course, to the, to the scholars. Uh, a few points, and I, I won't keep you. I know it's late. Um, the first thing that, that I think we should conclude from this conference is that there's a great need to shed stereotypes of each other. The old stereotypes are no longer uh, accurate uh, today, if they were ever accurate. They still exist. Um, it's, sometimes it's very hard for each side to part with these stereotypes. We even heard some, um, some voiced uh, during the course of this conference. Uh, Judaism and Christianity are no longer involved in a, what I called at one point a theological duel to the death, and sometimes it was a physical duel to the death. Um, that Christianity was the enemy of the Jewish people in the Middle Ages, they are no longer our enemy today. We have other enemies, um, and we dare not um, persist in, in uh, living the past and, and not guarding ourselves for the present and the future. Um, uh, there's a great need to keep talking to each other because we don't understand each other fully. Um, and we can learn from each other if we can continue talking to each other. We do have a set of common core values. One can call them the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach, fundamental mo rules of morality, natural law, whatever. But Christians and Jews, you know, I think stand alone today, virtually alone today, in proclaiming the intrinsic sanctity of the human being because he or she, and she is created in the image of God. You know, that's an extremely critical message that the world has to hear, and you hear it only from Christians and Jews, uh, to my knowledge. I can't, I, I can't, and Sikhs, okay, thank you very much. I, I was about to say I can't comment on the Asian religions, but certainly in the West, that's, these are the only people who are proclaiming that fundamental moral truth. 
Um, there's a need to cooperate to on a practical mean. level. Even when we don't agree theologically, there's a great need to, pri to cooperate on a practical level, both, I would say, for moral reasons and for practical political reasons. Jews and Christians are both in the crosshairs of the same enemies in the Middle East. And if you've been following the news about what's happened in Alexandria and in Baghdad um, and in Pakistan about Christians, you realize that in many ways we have the same enemies. Um, and lastly, um, this should be an ongoing enterprise. This should not be a two-day love fest or intellectual venture and then go home and everything is the same. Uh, the th real test of education is do things change after you've been educated. So hopefully this will be an ongoing enterprise. Uh, that's what the Center for Jewish-Christian Understanding and Cooperation is all about. It needs to be a sustaining enterprise. And I will just tell you that this was a two-year project. We've already begun the second two-year research project. Uh, we have a, a wonderful group of 16 scholars who are doing research on the question of the religious significance of the Jewish return to Zion, both Jews and Christians who are pursuing that and doing very serious research, as well as the connection and the correctives to uh, uh, the, the connection between religion and violence, right, and the correctives, you know, to uh, to the to the phenomenon of religious violence. So thank you very much. Um, I hope this was worthwhile for you. It was certainly worthwhile for us. Thank you.